Hello, I'm one of a group of people who are interested in the history of the Royal Naval Cordite Factory over in Dorset. But I'm here at the Museum of Naval Firepower at Pretty's Hard in Gosport in Hampshire, otherwise known as Explosion with an exclamation mark, which is a museum of the history of the gunnery within the Royal Navy. From cannons and gunpowder right through to modern guided weapons. For 200 years, Priddy's Hard acted as the arsenal for the Navy's base across the water in Portsmouth Harbour. For 40 years in the 20th century, cordite, the propellant for the Navy's shells, was produced at the Royal Naval Cordite Factory at Holton Heath in Dorset, about 60 miles west of here, and transported here to be filled into shells for use by the fleet. So what is cordite? Cordite is a mixture of nitrocellulose, otherwise known as gun cotton, and nitroglycerin. These are made by reacting the organic materials, in the case of gun cotton, obviously cotton, with nitric acid, and in the case of nitroglycerin, glycerin with nitric acid. Both these materials were discovered in the middle of the 19th century when the field of chemistry was expanding extremely rapidly. Both of them are extremely unstable and nitroglycerin in particular was so unreliable that its manufacture was banned in many countries across Europe. Gradually production methods improved and were made safer, but in fact neither of these materials on their own was satisfactory as a propellant since the reaction on ignition was far too violent. However, towards the end of the 19th century, Sir Frederick Abel at Woolwich Arsenal discovered that by mixing the two together, he could produce a material which had a much lighter reaction and turned out to be an ideal propellant. Nitroglycerin is an oily liquid. Nitrocellulose or gun cotton is a fairly stiff paste and these have to be mixed together. To facilitate that, we use a solvent called acetone. The finished paste is then forced through dyes to produce long rods, hence the name cordite. And these rods can be used either in canvas jackets to be used in the larger guns, or it can be used to fill cases. At the beginning of the First World War, industrialists and university people were asked to supply to the War Office any suggestions that might help the war effort. One of the suggestions that had been made was from Chaim Weizmann. He was at Manchester University, a biochemist, and he had a method of producing butyl alcohol and acetone biologically. Now, he was called by Churchill, who was First Lord of the Admiralty at the time, and it is said that he went to the office and said, Mr. Weizmann, I understand you can produce acetone biologically. He replied, yes, sir, but only in very small amounts in a laboratory. Churchill said, we need 20,000 tonnes of acetone, or we're going to have to change the process for producing our cordite. Can you scale things up for me? And what facilities do you need? Well, I'm going to need the services of a brewery, sir. Well, take over a brewery and see what you can do. So they took over the brewery of Nicholson's Gin Factory at Bromley. And in about six months' time, they'd actually produce batches of about a quarter of a tonne. So returning to Churchill, saying we've at least got large batches being produced, he said, right, you can take over breweries for use for that purpose, and I will build you a factory and one of my munitions factory in Dorset. And here it is, the result of the big decision by Churchill to have an acetone factory at Holton Heath. In this area was the enormous maize granary that supplied the acetone factory. That's the fuel for the whole process. The main railway line is alongside up on the embankment there. But all this was taken down after the plant 
came out of use in 1934. This whole acetone production plant was built in 1916. On the left here is the cooker house. After the material was cooked in the cooker house, it was sent into these fermentation vats. There were eight of these vats. They are about 36 foot in diameter. They are hollow from this band of concrete, which is at about six foot up. The idea is that you don't get heat transmitted into the ground because it's a warm process in the fermentation. The material goes in through this pipe and upwards into the vessel. The pipe connections above are probably for things like compressed air or hot or cold water to get the temperature right for the fermentation that was going on inside. Once the fermentation is completed, it will be pumped to the distillation house, which was on the far side of these. And there the acetone will be extracted. And the remains of the material, we're not quite sure what happened to it. It may well have been used for feeding pigs. Often this happened in brewing industry. The acetone factory kept going while there was a supply of maize. But the problem was in 1917 that the maize supply from America stopped because of the U-boats stopping them. So something else had to be used. James Weitzman had already tried potatoes and artichokes. Both of these would probably have to be specially grown in large amounts to be able to satisfy a plant like this. But the other materials were tried was conkers and acorns. Now, these were plentiful in the autumn, but it meant somebody had to go and pick them up. And here we've got a very good specimen of a conker tree actually on the site at Holton Heath. The problem with conkers was that the brown sh skins on them did affect the process a bit and acorns were preferably used. So a lot of information was got from the education department where we found that children at schools were going out to collect conkers and acorns. In the minute book of Lockyer School at Corf Mullen, there was an entry for October 1917. Many children off sick with whooping cough, but the remains are going to collect conkers for the Navy. One of the teachers I knew who pointed this out to me said, whatever would the Navy want conkers for? But with a little bit of research, we found this was probably the reason they wanted them to help in the acetone production. I went to have a look at their logbook at Corf Mullen and sure enough the next week in their entries children are still off with whooping cough but the remains have been taken by members of the staff in groups to collect good quality acorns and conkers from the local farms. So this is where a lot of the material was collected together. Poole Secondary School are recorded to having five tons of acorns collected. So they did very well considering they were in an urban area. Country schools might have done even better. An article in the Poole and Dorset Herald for October 1917 headed Acorns Urgently Needed indicated that farmers were being asked and landowners to allow people to come and collect acorns off their land and they were being offered one and three a bushel for them and sacks could be provided by the superintendent raw naval cordite factory so it confirmed that's where they were all going they were asked to be delivered to the local stations so that would mean they could come on the railway system here Well, these plant 
kept going all during the First World War. But at the end of the war, the demand for acetone reduced and eventually the process did change so that there could be a non-solvent system. These fermentation vats were still here at the beginning of the Second World War and the thought was to use them as refuges or air raid shelters. The top area was filled with soil. We could get in through these doors here, now been bricked up for safety reasons. It wasn't a great height inside and there was actually writing on the pillars inside saying, be careful of your head because there was not much height in there, but it was better that than not having shelters at all. In the soil at the top grew naturally seeded trees, and you see them now, after all these years, probably 20 or 30 feet high. I guess they must be the biggest flower pots in Dorset. I suppose I must have been about 20, 22, something like that. I worked in the danger zone, which was the Z ranges on the uh, flashless cordite, which had just not long been introduced. It had been introduced for the Navy. And we signed off the 10 o'clock, 2 to 10 shift. We signed off and left by the main gate to walk the distance to the railway station. All, you know, f glad to have finished the day's work and chatting and happily and that. It was very dark. We bought the train at Holton Heath and we're going along quite nicely all along and we perhaps get to about Rockley, I, I would imagine, um, about Rockley when the plane came over and then uh, a, the bomb dropped. I can't recall what happened about the bomb, but we all ended on the floor of the carriage and uh, well, you know, laughing and thinking, oh dear, it's the end sort of thing. And the driver of the train, he accelerated and we went on to pool. But, you know, we were all a little bit scared, of course. It wasn't a very good experience, but uh, uh, we we arranged, we got to Paul and a lot of the the train was a special train and they did say that the pilot had followed it down from Weymouth that was what we heard afterwards that he'd followed this train and he well he, everybody was on board at Holton it was a special train going, like taking the people home. So my conclusion of it was that he must have known, because he was only a lone raider. There wasn't, I can't recall any other planes. And as I say, the driver of the train, he accelerated and we got through to Paul. Whether he I don't recall whether he stopped at, way, at Hamworthy or not. But anyway, we went on and whatever had happened, he'd missed. Obviously, the incident had you know, shaken us a little bit. We're privileged to be able to come through this gate 
this fence was put up to divide the main part of the factory from that being used by the Admiralty Materials Laboratory. Seems rather strange to be coming in here, probably the first time for, since I retired about 17 years ago. Proceeding along the path towards the reservoir, we passed some air raid shelters which were provided for the people who lived in the main office and laboratories there. And we have a line of macrocarpa trees some of those that were planted in 1927, now probably being about 40 feet high. The reservoir was situated on the highest point on the site, Black Hill. It was originally here, and one of the reasons may be why the site was chosen. I've come up here nearly to the top of the service reservoir. Fairly steep steps all the way, but we've made it. This was the main storage of water for the whole factory from the First World War. I'm now here on top of the reservoir, a semicircular shaped reservoir, a straight side behind me here. The inlet for the water was on the far side there, where that building, the remains of the building is. The pumps for sending the water out was on this side. When it was originally built, half of it was covered in. And there's just, just about signs of the different color concrete on that area compared to this half. This half was open to the weather. It was also open to seagulls and other things. The reservoir contained about three million gallons. It was used for the factory, but also, of course, for domestic purposes for the people living in the various houses around here. The attention to the seagulls was not approved of, really, due to pollution of it. A decision was made by the superintendent in 1934 that they could do something about it by floating material on top of the water to deter them. And what was used was cordite trays. These were used in the early processes for holding cordite and through which could pass hot air to remove the acetone, which was the solvent used in there. There were hundreds and hundreds of these not being used because the process had changed for making cordite. These cordite trays fixed together with brass screws. It hadn't be, got to be steel screws, of course. And there were so many left that people were invited to take them home to make fences or gates so that these were used and floated on the surface of this half of the reservoir. The problem then was not realized that into the wood had been soaked nitroglycerin from the cordite. If you soak them on water, it slowly comes out of the wood into the water. And nitroglycerin, if you drink it, and that's what was happening in the domestic supply, gives you headaches. And people complained that they had headaches. And eventually it was tied up with possibly these floating of these trays on the water causing the problem. To cope with all this, the decision was made to fill the whole of this section in. 
So it meant draining the open part of this, build pillars to support the roof that was going to be put on here, and an uh, enormous amount of work was done to get it to what it looks like now. In the Second World War, with this uh, very large flat area and good visibility of round, there was nothing like so many trees as you see here now, but they could see lots of other things. And one of the things they were very concerned about, of course, was lights showing from the factory down below. So the home guard would be up here at either end of the reservoir. I understand they had lookouts and they could see lights. If there were any, they could then telephone down to wherever the building was to make sure that it was put out because it would be, a, I'm afraid, an encouragement for any bombers to come over and know that there was something important here. The other thing they had was light anti-aircraft guns up on here and even a weather station just to check on the weather conditions and one of the things they had to be prepared for was thunderstorms because somebody had to make a decision whether they could stop working in a thunderstorm. They also had to make decisions of whether they could stop working if there was bombing and this came from the observation post which is further down through the site here. I'm in the observation tower which stands on top of the observation post. There's a ladder in behind me. I can come up from the building below. There is a second exit which I'm coming up now. And now you see the conical top of this observation tower which is built on top of some very nice rows of brickwork inside. Up here there are observation slits all round the observation tower. People could come up the ladder inside, look out through these, just to confirm their aircraft right above them. They probably had the message over the telephones in the room down below. We have a picture taken at the beginning of the war of this site just been built. And there are no trees like this on the area it looks a completely com clear bit of ground. Here is the entrance to OP-1, the observation post, and this is how it looked originally. Entrance with concrete sides. We turn right, obviously to be prepared for explosions, it was made safe. You then turn left, and this part of the entrance is cast concrete tubes, down the side of which, in fact, are the remains of benches, they could be used as shelters. Turn again through some more concrete tubes and you come to a large rectangular room. Now empty, at the far end you can see the metal ladder up which you could go up to that observation tower that we saw before. On either side of the room there were benches with many telephones, obviously picking up calls from the whole area of letting them know if there was a likelihood of air raids and bombing. There were maps up on the wall. This one, which I discovered in 1994, is of the general area with Pool Harbour and Brown Sea Island clearly visible. And the second map shows Holton Heath at its centre with circles of distance radiating outwards. Both maps were found in a severely damaged state and they required a certain amount of work to piece them back together. Nearby were other small maps, this one showing VP 504, the government designated vulnerable point for the Royal Naval Cordite Factory. And here a list of the watch rotor for the personnel manning the OP-1 control trench. And we are told 
that there was even a chemical toilet for emergency use. But this is all now empty, other than the ladder up to the observation level at the end. Not far away from OP1, there are refuges. These were put in for the benefit of the people in the laboratories and main office, not far from here. These are built with concrete with wooden shuttering, different to some of the other ones who were built with concrete tubes. But there's an entrance here, there's another entrance right at the other end. One of the more interesting buildings still remaining at, uh, in the site here. This is where the four foot eight and a half railway engines were for running around the site. There were at least three of them we know about, uh, 060 saddle tanks. And they would come here obviously to be serviced and looked after uh, when they were not in use. They would go all the way through the siding and in fact up over the bridge and the overbridge down to Rockley Jetty, which was where the main supply of materials used to go up to about the late 1930s. We are not very far from the bridge, but you can see the embankment coming from the factory along in front of us, now well covered with gorse and all sorts of other trees, which then approaches the bridge and the uh, line then continues on the embankment on the far side, curving round to be pretty well parallel with the main line for a long way until it gets near to Rockley Jetty itself. And we're here on the bridge across the main line which connects up the factory with Rockley Pier. This is the bridge that was put in. The line from Holton Heath factory to the Rockley Pier had to cross the existing main line. And this is the bridge, the remains of it at least. It's now only a footbridge, but at least you can get over it and walk as far as the pier. The railway embankment here continues to the east, running parallel to the main line, high above the bay. The remains of a partly brick and concrete building could well have been one of the gun emplacements here in World War II. Just near the end of the embankment, we have the remains of one of the buildings. This would have been a mess room and a building where the staff working on the pier could use as a shelter. And also the people driving the trains could come in and use the facilities here. It's now just about collapsed. There's still some of the walls left only. The trains left the factory by the special gates and then proceeded here along the embankment. Best part of half a mile, you can imagine the steam trains coming along here with their loads of cordite. Over the years, the trees have completely overgrown it now so that its embankment is not visible. I am standing here at what remains of the Rockley Pier. This pier, you can only now see a few stakes out into the water 
but this is where the standard gauge railway came from the factory. Barges could pull alongside the pier and they could be loaded up with the cordite material, which was then taken to the filling stations. The material was taken in sailing barges. They could be pulled in on the left-hand side of the stakes, which you see out there now. They would be filled up with about 100 tons of cordite. They were towed to Stakes Boy out in the harbour and they could be then sailed all the way round to Pretty's Hard near Gosport, the filling station there, and then onwards to Chatham to Upnor Castle, yet another filling station. The railway line came through a special gate in the factory fence. It came over the bridge and then all the way along the embankment to here. Prior to the Second World War, the government got very worried about air attacks on things like the Nor Naval Cordite Factory and instituted some air defences, including batteries of guns. One oddity that they had, of which this is a model, was to build two towers quite close into the factory. On one was mounted a 40mm Bofors gun, on the other tower behind it was mounted a thing called a Carrison Predictor which was designed by a major A.V. Kerrison at the Admiralty Research Laboratories in Teddington in the 1930s. And that told the gun where to fire. The original, of which this is a model, is still here. It's about 30 feet high, reinforced concrete, and it was stationed on the heath, we believe, up on top of the hill here, to deter enemy aircraft from flying along the railway line which is just over behind the trees that you can see. The gun crew inhabited a Nissan hut behind the tower. Uh, about 10 men were stationed here um, to operate the gun and the predictor and to guard the tower itself. But their headquarters were some two miles away in Lichit Minster. The tower is now in fact a scheduled monument. The gun towers were part of the direct defences of the site, but we also used deception. Here on Gore Heath, about two miles west of the factory, we're in the middle of a forestry commission plantation. But 70 years ago, during the Second World War, this was the site of a decoy factory, one of two that were built. The other one was built at Arne in 1941 and was erected in six weeks by a group of scenic designers from the theatre and film industries and made out of scaffolding poles, canvas, timber, scrap metal and so forth. And this one was built a little later in 1942. In addition to all the decoy buildings that were built up the hill, they also built a large bunker here to accommodate the people who operated the decoy site. These were two men at a time from the home guard at the factory, one to patrol the perimeter and one to sit in the bunker ready to operate things. The things being flares to simulate incendiaries, tanks of water and, and oil to simulate fires and smoke, and lumps of old cordite which were used to simulate explosions, all to distract the enemy aircraft away from the factory itself. It was all operated electrically from inside the bunker, which had direct telephonic communication with the control trench OP1, which we've already seen in the factory. This one at Gore Heath was never used, to the great annoyance of the people who guarded it because they would have liked the opportunity. And it's interesting to think about these people sitting out here, ready to call down upon their heads the bombs from a major Luftwaffe raid to save the factory two miles away. 
The filming that you've been watching has taken place in 2011 and 2012, recording pretty well all that is left from the 1915 buildings, the Kaufmullen water supply, and the railway connections to the station and to Rockley Jetty. In 1915, this was about a square mile of open heathland. Soon after the outbreak of World War I, there was a great shortage of propellant to keep the army and the navy supplied from the existing factories, and the Ministry of Munitions set about building new factories all around the country. With the special needs of the navy in mind, and the distance which guns were required to fire shells, a special factory for the manufacture of naval propellant was planned, and this site, near the south coast and naval dockyards, on a piece of undeveloped land with access to road, rail and sea, far enough from large conurbations, but with reasonable reach of prospective employees, was chosen. In nine months, the whole site was in production, built by pick and shovel, by thousands of tradesmen and labourers eventually employing about 2,000 workers, the biggest industrial product in Dorset since the building of the railways. The number of employees increased to over 4,500 in World War II, and the site was made to be fairly inconspicuous by the use of camouflage and the maturing of 27,500 trees planted in 1927. Any lights at night were strictly controlled and the local home guard kept watch from the high point of the reservoir. The factory was surrounded with anti-aircraft gun sites, coordinated at Lichet Manor. The need for research into specialist materials for the Navy and the fact that many of the buildings at the RNCF site had become empty prompted the establishment of the Admiralty Material Laboratory in 1947 working in tandem with the now smaller RNCF, which finally closed in 1957. Under many different titles, the research work continued in the remaining quarter of the original factory site, whose buildings you have seen form the majority of this film, until 1997, when the Ministry of Defence moved out. But despite the factory having an excellent safety record, with so many people being employed and large amounts of propellant being produced, a very serious accident took place in 1931. On the 23rd of June at 10.43 a.m., an enormous explosion occurred in one of the two nitroglycerin nitrators. It was heard all around the area, even as far as Dorchester, and the column of brown gas rising from the explosion was seen as well, giving some idea of where it had happened. Sadly, 10 men lost their lives and 19 were injured. Aerial photographs were taken by two newspapers, the Daily Sketch and Daily Express, by illegally overflying the site, for which they were both fined. A memorial service was held in the square outside the main offices some days later where members of the families of the departed attended, and there was a large gathering of staff as well as a band and guard of honour. An inquiry was held and concluded that the reason was the formation of crystalline nitroglycerin, which is exceptionally sensitive to shock. In 1935, the decision was made to replace the nitroglycerin plant, and this time with a continuous rather than a batch process. And this was brought in from Germany the Schmidt plant with their specialist engineers and welders who stayed locally at bed and breakfast or in the local hotels. The knowledge that they gathered while they were here was very useful to the Germans to identify what was visible on the aerial shots that were taken in August 1940 by the Luftwaffe. The replacement plant consisted of a production unit covered by up to 12 feet of concrete and soil up to a total of about 40 feet. The remains of this, surrounded by trees, is still in the centre of the former factory, but is easily identified on the scale model. Without former employees who remembered what went on on the factory and on the site since, and those people who kept records and photographs, 
this bit of industrial history would have been forgotten.